this windy, blustery spring morning. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Morning, Ethan. What else we got? Austin, Mr. Bacon, DB something, Nick, Odysseus, Scum Shop, and Zach Belds. Uh, all right, so let's uh, let's get to it. So what I wanted to do today, uh, at least to start off, was to kind of look uh, look a little bit more in detail as to uh, something we were looking at uh, last time, uh, namely, um, let's go back to. So we were looking at our predator prey system uh, last time, and uh, we fixed the the, the silly mistake on my part from uh, Wednesday. Uh, and we looked at how to solve this both with Mathematica's fancy pants uh, differential equation solver and also um, manually programming in the Euler method uh, and then sort of the issues that arise with that. Um, so what I wanted to, to at least kind of start with today um, was a little bit of a discussion about these constants. So the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, that sort of thing. Um, and um, sort of what, uh, what the situation with those uh, is. So let's go back over to Mathematica and um, look at kind of what we had before. So um, the constants that I picked here, you notice were a little different than the constants I picked um, before, um, namely, or uh, what, what we wrote down on Wednesday. Uh, so I just picked all ones and then a 0.5. And kind of what I wanted to talk about was if we adjust those constants, what's going to happen to the solution curve? So uh, here, uh, well, first off, so we, we really solved this thing twice. We solved it with the Euler method, which I used to produce the, the dashed line solution. And then we used the fancy pants Mathematica solution, which I used to make the solid line uh, solutions. And then we put the two next to each other to, um, uh, to sort of compare um, how good the Euler method solution is from the sort of fancy pants Mathematica solution. Um, and the answer is that as long as your step size is small enough, it's pretty good and it starts to kind of creep in with some error as you go along. Um, sort of the, the idea with the Euler method is that the errors accumulate and so it gets worse and worse over uh, the time of the simulation. Um, there are, like I said, much, much, many more sophisticated methods besides the Euler method um, that uh, so Mathematica is going to basically pick one out of its little toolbox of methods and, and throw it at the problem, uh, something that, that works nicely. Um, okay, so let's, um, let's maybe tweak uh, some of these constants and kind of see what, um, what we get for solutions. And for the sake of demonstration at the moment, let's actually turn off the uh, Euler method solution and only look at the fancy pants solutions um, just because they're, they're so much better. Um, and then the other thing that, uh, that we can do, so let's, let's change the constants. So what I'll do here is I'm going to make a second version of this here and I'll put oops get rid of the show there and I've already used P and Q so I'm gonna make this um, um, I'm gonna I'll also make a copy of this here um, and I'm gonna call it predpray 2 and then for the R's, I'm going to make two copies of it, but they will use the PredPray 2 version instead of the PredPray version. All right, and then I can graph R1 and R2. 
Um, I should probably also change the colors here um, so that uh, we can kind of see. So let's, instead of black, let's do orange. And instead of blue, let's do purple. Uh, hopefully that'll turn out uh, visible enough. Uh, and then, the, right now, if we were to run this, we would basically get two copies of the exact same graph. Uh, what is variable uh, D? Uh, so D is this one here. This is the coefficient on uh, the predator side. Basically, it's, um, it's going to control for each prey that a predator eats how much growth does that give the predator's population. Um, so it, the lower the number D is, the more prey you have to eat in order for a given predator to, um, or the predator population to go up. And uh, the, the larger this is, then the fewer. Um, and we'll look at if we basically double D for example what happens to the um, what happens to the to the solution all right so we'll, all, along with the other constants what I'm going to do is replace uh, a B G and D with uh, a 1 B 1 and so on and that means that over he up here I can define those as new constants like so and then I don't have to go through and retype the constants every time I use them okay so again if we were to or sorry if we were to run this right now uh, we now have one difference which is that we've made the D constant different for uh, the two different versions of the solution. So let's run it and see um, see what we get. So let me solve, um, let me move this here and let's make this the R solutions. Okay, so this would be um, Looks like I already did it. Okay, so let's uh, let me leave that alone for a second. So what we did was we plotted here the original solution with the original set of constants along with the new set of constants, and we can kind of look at what happens here. So uh, just to remind ourselves, the red and the blue curves were our original set of solutions and the orange and the purple curve were our new set of solutions for the modified uh, value of D. So um, the first thing to note is that by increasing D, um, then the, uh, the prey population never uh, grows bigger than the predator population uh, in the total in terms of these peaks here. Um, and that makes sense because basically what we've ma made it is that each predator um, eats a single or eats uh, a particular unit of prey and um, uh, by those constants being one, in, in a sense it means that the predators and the prey are, um, uh, let's see how to put it, um, uh, interchangeable I guess you could say um, now if we go back to the differential equations let me go back to the iPad for a second um, uh, one second if we go back to our system of equations um, then um, we might basically think um, so the, let's let's look at the constants beta versus delta and kind of talk about what the difference is um, because you might think that beta and delta should be the same number um, and uh, if we think about it for a minute maybe we should argue why it shouldn't be so beta would basically be 
uh, how many, uh, sort of what is the rate at which the predators are going to eat the prey. Um, and delta, the delta xy term is going to control how much the predators grow for a given amount of eating prey. And those might be the same number, um, but they might not be. So that's to, to contrast that a little bit with our SIR models um, that we had down here below. So if you look at the SIR models, then the um, uh, notice that the rate at which uh, one thing is declining, so compare this term with this term, and then say this term with this term, there the, the constants were basically the same uh, because you are moving from one compartment to another. Um, so that's a little different from the predator-prey model, uh, which is here that the beta xy term, this is going to control how fast prey get eaten and this term is going to control, uh, given predation, how fast do the predators grow for a given amount of, of eating. Um, so, right. Now, if we go back to Mathematica, then um, if we replace the constants with all ones, right, so here are the only change we made was D, um, uh, changing D from 0.5 up to 1, then we see the effects that it has in terms of when you get your population spikes um, for the predators and the prey under both versions of the model. Um, and if we go back up and we kind of mess with the constants, um, let, let's say the, the alpha term, uh, let me change that to say 2, uh, the idea being that um, uh, the prey, if there are no predators, would grow really fast. Um, so I'll double that right there. And uh, let's, let's change this back to 0.5 and kind of see what that effect has. So now we have the same D for both models, but we've changed the A for both models. And if we run that, we see uh, the effects that because I doubled the A value, the predators, or sorry, the prey, are going to start here at the same value, but their population is going to go up much, much, much more quickly. And uh, because of that, their population spiking a lot more and a lot more quickly, the predator population is going to come to a, a maximum much more quickly, and then they will die off. And then we see here basically the same periodicity uh, that we see with the, um, uh, the other models. So the time difference between peak to peak uh, here looks to be basically about the same, maybe slightly uh, different, than the difference between peak to peak on the other model. Um, it looks slightly shorter to me. So for example, uh, it looks like the distance between say, like the purple curve and this blue peak versus the purple curve and this blue peak is a little bit shorter. So it's a, a little bit of a faster cycle um, time-wise, but, uh, but eh, close, close to our old one. And if we were to make something like, let's make kind of a, a ridiculous, um, thing, then we can see, you know, sort of exaggerate that effect. Um, and it's clipped off here because the population gets really big. Um, okay. So, uh, all that to say that, um, that, uh, we can sort of tweak these constants and think about what effect they're going to have on the solution, but also what do the constants themselves mean? And that's kind of where it was uh, the definition of the model that A is sort of the what would happen to the prey if they could grow indefinitely, um, B is sort of the eating rate, 
G would be the starvation rate if the predators have no food, and D would be sort of the how much does the predator population grow for a given amount of, of uh, pre predatoring, so eating of things. Um, okay, so um, now we, we could modify this system a little bit. So for example, um, perhaps it's maybe not reasonable to suppose that the, um, that the prey can grow indefinitely. Um, so we looked at a model uh, of population growth. Uh, this was one of the first ones that we looked at. So when we started this whole business with differential equations, um, we looked back at our exponential model. And then we said, OK, for population growth, that's maybe not completely reasonable. Uh, it might be reasonable for, like, let's say, bacteria in a Petri dish for a while. But eventually, you run out of food and the population dies back off. So um, so let's make a, a third copy of our system here. And this one, I'm going to use, uh, let me call this PredPrey3. I'm going to make a minor tweak to the system. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and just reset everything. So it's the same as the original system. Uh, with so predpray two, um, actually, you know what? Let me not do that. Let me do instead. I'll make this one just use the a and b, the regular constants. Okay, uh, but this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tweak the model itself. Um, namely, we've talked about. That So let me go back to the iPad for just a moment and talk about the tweak I want to make here. Um, okay, so the, the alpha x term that's at the front basically is exponential growth. And if we go back up to, um, so let me highlight there, this was exponential growth, okay? which would be like this term only up above, which was our differential equation for exponential growth. But then we modified that by tacking on this second term to say, all right, there's probably some limit to the population. Um, and if we multiply the two of those together, then what we got was the logistic growth curve and that was sort of that S looking shape where the growth was exponential at the beginning, but then started to kind of level off to some sort of maximum. So let's uh, maybe modify the predator prey system to take that kind of idea into account that perhaps there's some limit of the number of prey that could exist, uh, assuming that there were no predators, and then kind of look at what that does to the solution. Okay, um, and in fact, if we go back one page, um, this here was the logistic differential equation, and the population, the curve that we got sort of looked like that. So it's sort of exponential at the beginning, and then it sort of started to level off towards some, some uh, level, which we called the carrying capacity. Um, okay, so, uh, so let's go back to Mathematica, and let's basically tack on uh, for this term right here that I've got highlighted. Basically, let's suppose that there's some sort of limit on the prey's population, assuming there are no predators. And to pick a number for that, let's just go down and look at our graph real quick. Let's just, and I'm just going to completely arbitrarily choose 20 as a, as a limit for this, and we'll see what happens there. So I'll call L equal to 20, and then on this version, what I'm going to do is do prey times L minus prey, and so if I set B to 0, and G to 0, and D to 0, so assume basically there were no predators, then I would get that sort of S-shaped graph for the prey instead of a full exponential graph. All right, um, 
So we also want to plot this. So let's, uh, let's copy all this and let's make S1 and S2. This time we're using the PredPray 3 solution and I want to graph the originals here against um, the new version. So let's run this and see what we get. All right, so this is kind of interesting. Um, the um, so which what which color did we make which? Um, let's go back and look. Uh, so we made predators orange and prey purple. Okay. So predators were orange and prey was purple. So the prey kind of rose exponentially. They would have started to level off here, um, but, uh, but then of course the predators start eating them and our predator population uh, looks like it's settling in on this value here, which doesn't look a whole, all that realistic. Um, let's actually lower the L value and see kind of what that does. Okay, so which one was which again? I'm sorry. Predators were orange and prey was purple. Okay, so this doesn't seem actually, when we look at the solution, to be a particularly reasonable uh, thing because in particular what it says is that the prey population um, which is uh, the purple population uh, levels off on a particular value and the predators level off at a particular uh, constant value. Um, and there's a lot more predators in the long term than the prey in the long term. That doesn't seem particularly reasonable. Um, okay, so maybe this wasn't the best uh, best idea, but Eh, you can kind of mess with it and say, um, let's see, make sure that I didn't mess something up here. Um, well, we could also do the same thing for the predators. Um, and, okay, that doesn't... Uh, look in particular reasonable. It basically says that the predators all die. Um, all right, well, that was a bit of a disaster, but eh, that's okay. Um, all right, so let's delete the evidence because that didn't go anywhere. Um, and go back to our, our nice set of solutions there. Um, okay. So uh, the last thing I wanted to do is just sort of mention that you guys notice how the solutions here are kind of periodic, that you get this sort of boom-bust cycle uh, for these things. Uh, I wanted to show you guys sort of another way that we could think about the solutions to this. And for that, what I want to do is come back up here to where I defined basically two functions um, for, uh, and I called them capital F and capital G, um, and uh, that w we use those functions in our Euler method solution. Basically, all those are were the right-hand sides of the differential equations, just written out in, in slightly more compact form. Um, so what I want to do is actually use these guys to graph a stream plot. And here, um, when we did the stream plots before, we always put the, so the direction of the arrow was one comma something. Well, that's when we only had one variable problems. Now we have a two variable problem. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to think of the slope of the arrow will be F in the run and G in the rise. And 
Uh, because these two things are two completely independent functions from one another, what this means is that the arrows can go backwards, up, down, left, right, whatever. Um, and then I need to graph this. So let's do it looking at our graph for the originals. Uh, we had anywhere from looks like 0 to 10 on the predator-prey scale, uh, looking at the, the red and the blue curves that of our originals. So I'll do it from 0 to 10 in both variables. Um, and if we do that, then what we get is this kind of shape. Okay, and um, what we notice here is a couple of things. So first off, if we said that the solution of a differential equation is picking your initial condition, okay, so if I, I picked here that we started with 0.1 predators, or 0.1 units of predators, and one unit of prey, that put us basically uh, roughly where my mouse cursor is uh, right there, okay? And then the solutions are going to follow a solution, or, or are going to follow the arrows. Well, if I dropped my point right here, and I let it follow the arrows, what would happen to it? So looking at that, that stream plot, what do you guys think? What would happen to, um, if I were to drop sort of a feather right there and let it follow the, um, follow the, the arrows, what would happen to it? So many brilliant ideas this morning. Any ideas? Come on, guys, wake up. I know it's Monday in the morning, and maybe early, especially if you're not on Eastern time. Um, it's still early on Eastern time. All right, well, this is awkward. All right, so basically what would happen, right, if, if we follow the arrows, it's going to go in sort of a loop. So it would go in sort of a loop, and that makes sense because we've got a periodic solution here. Uh, so if we look at um, this one, right, we see our boom and our boom in the two populations and then our two busts, so it kind of just goes round and round, and that's exactly what we see here, okay, that we would just go round and round. And in fact, all of the solutions are going to be uh, periodic. Uh, the question is just how, what the period is, um, and that depends on where you start. So if we tweaked the two numbers I had, where did I put them? Uh, right here. I used one starting one predator, or sorry, one prey unit and 0.1 predator units, uh, and that's the same as what I did here was to say initially there's 0.1 predator units and one prey unit, so just a 10 to 1 ratio, and then all we would do is loop around this graph over and over and over and over. Um, now, one other thing that is kind of interesting now that we've plotted it is what's going on with this little dot here in the middle? So what's interesting there? So that would be if we started with <clears throat> x, which is the number of prey, at 2, and y, which is, sorry, the dog, hang on, Mia. No, come on. Come on. Out of here. Come on. Go, go, go. 
Come on, out. Go. Go see. All right, sorry about that. Um, so, what was I saying? Um, the, um, um, what I was saying was the, uh, wh what's going on with that dot in the middle there? Any, any ideas about that? So it looks like it's at X equals two, roughly Y equals one, roughly. So let's actually go up and use my orange curve, um, these guys, and let's, let's, those we got, so let's say there we had initially two prey and one predator. Okay, so there was our purple curve, and... Yeah, two prey and one predator, and, oh, I need to change that constant back. Okay, so what happened there was that um, uh, we get basically constant level solutions for the predator and the prey, okay? So that would be uh, here where we initially start out with two units of prey and one unit of predator, and those two values just so happen to be exactly the right number so that the population curves aren't actually curves, they're straight lines. So this is, there's exactly enough food and the rate of growth of the rabbits or the prey is exactly compensated for the rate at which they're eaten and the populations basically are stable at these constant values for all time. And here we could see that on the graph based on uh, the dot there. If we were to follow the arrows on the dot, we would basically just not go anywhere. Um, another way you can think about that is the further away from that dot you are, you swirl around it. And so if we got closer and closer and closer, we'd be swirling basically in a uh, so small of a difference that eventually it would sort of basically just be a point. Um, okay, so uh, what that tells us, right, is that there is a constant solution to this, um, and perhaps that shouldn't have been a surprise. So um, if we look back up at our differential equations again, so let me go back up to uh, here, or actually maybe here would be easier to see. Okay, so those were the two right-hand sides of the differential equation. And uh, what we can see from this is that there are two ways that you can have a constant solution. Um, and a constant solution will occur whenever, for whatever values of x and y you throw at this, this term is all zero. Okay, well, one way that that could happen would be if x is zero. Okay, but that means that there's no prey. Uh, and if x is 0, then and y is 0, which would be the, what does it there, that would be the solution where there are no predators and there are no prey. And the population would stay constant at 0 for both of those. Well, that makes sense. Predators and prey aren't just going to sprout out of the ground. Um, they have to be in existence before anything can happen. Um, the other solution, though, that we just found was sort of a, a, a one where the particular values of A, B, G, and D and the particular initial value meant that uh, this term was always zero, even though X, Y, A, and B individually were not zero. So basically, this term, the AX, and that term, the rate at which the things were being eaten, were exactly equal. Um, and uh, then similarly, these two terms there were exactly equal. And so what we got was a steady state, constant solution uh, to both, uh, to both uh, populations. Um, and yeah, so we saw that there. So that corresponded to our dot uh, right there. Um, 
now I should mention that with respect to the um, the SIR model, um, you might say, could we do this this sort of stream plot with the SIR model? And the answer is yes and no. Um, we sort of we could do it, but it wouldn't look like this because the SIR model has three variables, not two. So let me go to the documentation and show you guys. There is a 3D version of the, um, or actually it's called vector plot. There is a 3D version of the vector plot function, but that you could use for uh, the SIR model, but it's basically, it's a lot harder to read uh, what is going on there. Um, so it's sort of not really worth it, um, not really worth the trouble um, initially, just because how do you read something in three dimensions? Um, okay, but this gets us the idea, uh, I think, with the solid stuff. All right, so uh, let me pause and, and ask if there are any questions over this stuff. Um, the uh, We've looked a lot here at the predator-prey models and kind of what uh, how the different constants tweak things there. Uh, if we go back to the SIR model file, um, then this is what we were messing with, I think, on Wednesday. Uh, which is to look at sort of the population graphs, assuming um, um, things and or assuming this sort of set of constants. And uh, I still think I'm a little bit got some sort of problem here with the infectiousness. Um, but I think I've got maybe one of these fractions upside down. Let's try that. Yeah, that looks more reasonable. Um, and uh, so we get, you know, sort of the, the classic population growth curves here. Um, this, there were basically two constants that controlled things with um, uh, the SIR model. One was sort of b uh, based in terms of how long a person stayed infected. And then this other constant, beta, which we just said was R naught times the the gamma uh, thing, and R naught was basically how virulent the thing is. So on average, how many people uh, does a given infected person go on to infect? Obviously, there's going to be a range of that. There might be an infected person who immediately quarantines and they don't infect anybody else, uh, but there could be somebody who doesn't even know that they have the infection that goes about their daily lives and ends up spreading it to 10 people. So the R0 value is an average. Um, and if we change that R0 value, so let me make it three, then what that does is it makes the disease curve happen faster, but also if we look back at, it also makes the peak higher. So at R0 for two for this particular model of disease, we get a little over 20,000 people that get it or at peak. Um, so more than 20,000 people get the disease, um, but uh, the, the maximum here is the number of simultaneous cases, which is a little over 20,000 in this example. If I up R0 to 3, then we get our, uh, you know, close to say 45,000 cases simultaneously. And the sum total of cases would be basically the recovered number, uh, which would be here. So if you tweak the value of R0, then things get much worse. Um, and uh, so in this particular example with an R0 of 3, basically if left to its own devices, the disease will spread and essentially the almost the entire population will eventually get it. Um, and so if we say, okay, um, the entire population eventually gets it, and uh, 
one percent of them die, then well, we can calculate the uh, the number of deaths um, pretty easily. It's just a proportion. Um, so uh, with respect to the COVID-19, uh, basically all of the so if we think about if we accept that the, this SIR model is a reasonable model for COVID-19, then there are really only two constants that control everything. Um, we saw before that the initial number of infected actually doesn't really change things very much. All it does is delay the curves. So if I crank this up to 10 infectious, um, we get the exact same shape as we did before. It just happens sooner. Okay, so the actual initial number of infected people is not really the issue. Um, also, the initial number of infected people is not something that we can control. There were however many people infected, and that's that. Um, we also cannot really control, maybe to some extent we could, the amount of time that a person is infectious. Um, so particularly for uh, people that uh, do not know, do not even uh, have symptoms of the of the infection, uh, that they don't even know that they're infectious. Um, so this again, I guess, would be an average of sort of how long the infection lasts. Um, if that number could be lowered, then that would reduce the amount of time that somebody was able to go on and infect others. And how could we control that? Well, um, one would be uh, if there's some sort of medication that you could uh, take that reduces the infectiousness or how long you have the disease. Um, with COVID-19, we don't know of any such thing. Uh, but if we take sort of the seasonal influenza, uh, how many of you guys have had the flu and then gone to the doctor and gotten uh, Tamiflu? Uh, to treat it. Um, so if within 24 hours of getting the flu infection um, you uh, are able to start Tamiflu then it uh, reduces the length of the disease and it makes you basically able to recover faster which um, which would impact both how long you stay infected and perhaps to another extent the rate at which you can transmit the infection, uh, the R0 value. Um, so with, uh, with COVID-19, we don't really know of any, any drugs that, uh, or therapeutic measures that can reduce the, uh, the time that basically it takes your immune system to, to become immune. Um, there's a lot of talk about hydrochloroquine, chloroquine, quinine, something like that but there's no evidence that it's, it's actually effective yet. Um, not in, in, you know, there's no data to support it. There's just anecdote. Um, but then the other thing you can do to control the uh, infection curve is all centered around lowering R0. So R0 being three or whatever is basically the number uh, of average infections that a person produces uh, who's already infected, and the lower that value, so if we make this like 1.1, then on the time scale in question, basically you don't see anything, right? You get very little, um, you get exponential growth, but after I'm doing this on a 52 two, two week time scale, you basically don't get hardly, you know, five infections over that period of time and basically nothing nothing happens but if you make this you know say two then we do get this sort of peak business going on and so with an R naught of two this particular disease uh, looks like we would I need to go a little bit further out in time but it looks like we're leveling off to maybe you know a significant chunk of the population getting it um, so this, by the way, the reason I put 1.1 there is 1.1 or so is roughly speaking what the infectiousness is of the seasonal influenza. And 
uh, the fact that that's so small would mean that a given influenza virus would go through the population and maybe eventually infect a bunch of people, but it's not going to do so quickly enough that uh, eventually, um, basically, everybody's going to have immunity. And this is one reason why, so, so you could ask the question, why is it that we all get the flu every year, or why is it that we have influenza every year, uh, if uh, the, the model predicts that, uh, that it should be dying off over time. Um, so any ideas, um, where are my bio majors, why we get the flu year after year after year uh, when this model says that it basically should die off and we never see it again. So any brilliant ideas? Yes, exactly, Willie. Mutation. So uh, this low value of R0 puts a pretty strong pressure, evolutionary pressure, on the influenza virus to mutate. And to mutate in such a way that it uh, is new enough that immune systems aren't able to just instantly handle it. Uh, so the same thing could be said here with the uh, sort of common colds uh, that go around. There are thousands upon thousands of variations on the, those diseases. Um, they're not particularly infective. They're also not particularly deadly. I mean, they don't, um, you know, yes, people do die of influenza, but it's not a very, very large number um, or percentage wise. So, um, yeah, now with uh, other viruses, viruses that have a large R0 value, um, so you could take, for example, uh, well, COVID-19 has something, we're not entirely sure where the R0 is for that because, well, we're still kind of in the midst of it, uh, but two and a half, three, something like that. Um, I've seen some speculation that actually four is more reasonable, uh, at least sort of for, uh, with, with, uh, no preventative measures, um. So uh, there, you know, we do, I think, know of, of two strains now of COVID-19. Um, how close they are to each other, I don't know. I'm not that kind of doctor. Um, but yeah, so mutation is something that this model is sort of incapable of taking into account. Uh, and essentially what you would do is you would have to say, all right, if there's a mutation, you treat it as an entirely new disease um, that had nothing to do with the first one. Um, okay, so the R0 value here really is all about, um, that's something that can be controlled. Um, and so all of the efforts that people are making in terms of, or governments are making in terms of enforcing stay-at-home orders and social distancing and uh, people wearing masks and lots of disinfection all over in public spaces, grocery stores and so on, all of those things are aimed at lowering this number. And as we saw, uh, that number doesn't necessarily get lowered to the point where a significant portion of the population don't still get the disease. Um, and so sort of the, the thought there is that if we could just, uh, well, basically, we could end the coronavirus in two weeks in the following way. Everybody stays home and locks their doors and sits around for two weeks. Uh, after that, it'd be done because anybody who had it would have recovered and uh, there would be no more transmission. That's not feasible, obviously. People need to get food and whatnot. Um, and so the tweaking the R0 value isn't necessarily done with the goal of getting the total number of people who, have, who get the infection over time to go down. Um, that would be nice, but what it's really centered on, right, is getting this peak uh, to be lower down so that the number of simultaneous infections doesn't overwhelm your healthcare system, and that's the whole business with flattening the curve that people are talking about. Um, then the other thing here is, so I've graphed this on a one-year time scale. I could graph it on a two-year time scale without really any, any difficulty. Um, so let me let me do times two here, 
and um, so that would be the solution curve with an R naught of, of three. If we lower that to an R naught of two, then, right, it slows down. And if I, let's try 1.5, okay, to be something like this. Well, by the time we get into two years, What's something that uh, that would change the model and change the disease transmission uh, if we uh, are talking out like a year or two time scale? So what's one thing that the model doesn't take into account? Well, it's 8.50, so I'll just go ahead and give it to you. Um, yeah, okay, good point, Willie. This doesn't take into account that people are going to be born. Um, and uh, there there are versions of the model um, where um, you could take into account, basically, uh, population dynamics that, you know, this assumes a sort of constant 150,000 people. Obviously, we know over... The span of well even a week that population will change there will be people that are born and similarly there will be people who die not necessarily because of the virus but just because that's life um, the other thing I was going to say was um, immunization so this model doesn't take into account um, any immunization now, if we go out a year or two from now, there will probably be a vaccine available for this disease. And what a vaccination does is essentially it moves some portion of the people who are vaccinated. Um, people who are getting get vaccinated are people who haven't had the disease before yet, probably. Um, and it basically moves them directly into the recovered uh, population. Uh, by without having actually uh, contracted the disease. So um, the model doesn't take that into account. Of course, we, do, we know that, that there are many different people trying to, to discover a vaccine or develop a vaccine for this, for this infection, um, but none is available yet. Um, and uh, we don't know exactly how long it'll be before that happens. So... All right. Well, so I think uh, I think this does a pretty good job, uh, hopefully, of going through the these several different differential equations models. Um, the predator prey is sort of a, a first example of a system of differential equations, and then the SIR model as a um, an example of a, a slightly more sophisticated model. Um, excuse me, that we can use to, um, to model something that is affecting us all right now. Um, all right, so I'll quit here, and uh, on f Wednesday what we're going to do is uh, start talking about integration. Uh, I wasn't really sure how far we would get today. Um, so we'll start talking about integration, which is uh, Chapter 5 in the book, and uh, then that'll kind of tidy things off. This also means that I'm about at the point to being able to... Uh, uh, to give you guys the project details for the end of the semester. Uh, if you have not already taken, uh, filled out the little survey on Canvas uh, about the final project, uh, please do so later today. Uh, I sent an announcement about it. Um, last time I checked, there were only a couple people that had done it, but I'd, uh, I'd like to get y'all's thoughts uh, before making some decisions. So, all right, so I'll quit the stream here. I hope you guys have a good rest of your day. Uh, and I will see you Wednesday, if not sooner.